Thank you, Ludmil. Uh, you say, why is somebody who is not a mathematician is here to say a few words and open uh, uh, this session? And uh, it goes a little bit further back. We had uh, a discussion about, uh, about uh, must have been a year and a half ago with uh, Ludmil. Uh, both of us are from neighboring countries in Europe. I'm from Greece, uh, he's from Bulgaria, and we're chit-chatting about important mathematicians in in the old times, so where the Greeks had the upper hand, but also, more importantly, in recent times. Um, and uh, I mentioned the name of uh, Nigel, and then uh, Ludmil tells me, you may have a chance to introduce him. And I didn't know this will happen, but uh, here we are, a year and a half later, uh, he's here. Uh, he's uh, the person that, uh, if you think about living mathematicians and the influence they have had, on the discipline uh, is the one the person comes to mind. And uh, what uh, surprised me, I started looking uh, further into, into math, because I'm a chemist, so therefore I'm a little bit on the quantitative side, so I can understand some, but not everything that what you do. Uh, it was uh, the breadth of uh, his influence. You know, the many, many different fields where you can look at contributions, say, and in this field as well, uh, so uh, it's very, it's very actually uh, humbling to to say that because uh, a lot of us work in one area and try to make contributions. But if you can't make contributions that are lasting and that can affect all these areas of uh, uh, science and mathematics, uh, uh, you are something special. And beyond that, uh, you look at uh, what influence you are going to have. And as our faculty members, uh, we always appreciate when our students. Uh, are out there transforming uh, science and mathematics and certainly uh, his students have done a tremendous job and for us here because so we're looking at IMSA and we're looking at IMSA's uh, mathematics in the Americas we're very happy to see that uh, several of your students are actually influencing mathematics in the Americas uh, an area where we try to to build the connections and because, as we know, mathematics is the language of the world. More people speak mathematics than English or Chinese, so it's very Mandarin. Sorry, it's very important that uh, that we recognize the influence that that will have. So, among the areas that uh, he has uh, contributed, of course, uh, special metrics on Abelian Hodge theory, Langlands duality, and mirror symmetry. We're going to hear some of it uh, from him during this conference. Um, and when you look at the awards, I mean, it's uh, essentially the most important awards in mathematics. Uh, the Sylvester Metal in 2000, Polya Prize 2002, So Prize in 2016. So thank you for coming here and joining us, Nigel. I think that's uh, very important. Uh, we look at uh, the science, but also look for, to you for advice 
about how we can take IMSA to the next level. Uh, IMSA uh, has been in the works for a long time, but materialized as a university center just uh, a month ago. Uh, so that's an important recognition of the work that's being done and what we expect in the future about the contributions that uh, IMSA will make to mathematics. Uh, thank you. Unfortunately, I have another meeting coming up and uh, Ludwig told me, if you can give us 15 minutes, come over and say, of course I come because I always wanted to meet you. Thank you. Morning, everybody. So we see more of the Institute of Mathematics in Miami. And we started very early with a joint report of Rudy, Lino, and Ernesto, who was called Institute of Mathematics Miami in the state of And after a while, they managed to materialize here at the with the support of the University of the San Jose Foundation. IMSA also has a consortium of institutions uh, that somehow support the idea to have this communication of mathematics uh, in North and South, or the US and Latin America, also Europe. And, uh, and in this um, uh, committee, there is Oscar Garcia Prada and Professor George Anderson. And in one of these meetings, it was decided that it was very important to highlight all the contributions of the person. Like teaching in mathematics and not, not, not only in mathematics, but in mathematical lives, in people's lives. This mathematics takes life, and we are all here to zoom out of joy and to celebrate these changes in our lives through mathematics and the advice of professional education. And the IMSA has a executive board of this consortium, and among the people that are there is Ludmi. Ludmi, who was here at the beginning, she's <laughs> the director of the institute. That is great. She has to play. Uh, but among the members of the of the executive board, there's Ernesto Luperzi, who is uh, sitting on the right hand side. There is also Garcia Prada, who is sitting in the middle. And there is also Tina Mina Tagner, who is not here present. And I want to highlight like Professor Philip Griffiths, who is also sitting in the board, and is also the chair of the scientific advisory. The board of, the, of IMSA, anything that has to do with the scientific part of the institute goes to the committee that he chairs. And we also have uh, some Mississippi people here, uh, some people that support us yet, who is going to be in charge of all communication and computers, the uh, whole institute with technology. Danny Puerto, who is not here, who is the office manager, he, she's in charge of, of everything else, and perhaps some of you have received emails from her regarding the boss and the reports. Regarding the reporting, at some point this week, we'll let you know how they will go. They will be everything online, the person in charge of those reinforcements. And we have a um, bus, the people staying at the Marriott. The bus leaves at 9 a.m. every day morning, and it leaves from here to the hotel at the end of the afternoon. So today is at 6.25 p.m., the same place where we were left, for people that don't know, is somewhere there. Yeah. So just stick to us and then we'll show you where it is. I also want to highlight that this uh, event is uh, also from our sponsor organized by the International Center for Mathematical Sciences in Sofia, Bulgaria, and Belishka here. And she's the deputy director of the institute, and we have many colleagues of us coming from Bulgaria to this event. So welcome also to you to um, there are some uh, food courts uh, for lunch and for coffee, which are across the lake. Uh, and um, we all, uh, and this is Natalia, and I think of for us for anything to do with the So, after all that, you can talk to either Ernesto, Ludwig, if you see him, or me, and with anything that has to do with the University of Miami or the IMSA here. And anything scientific, you can talk to Oscar, Jurgen, and Ernesto, who are the organizers scientifically. So, welcome, all of you. And we are about to start. You might see the program in the web page. So, if you look at IMSA, there's events, you see the program there. Our first speaker of the day is Professor Jurgen Anderson, one of the first students of nine. So, he is the director of the Center for Quantum Mathematics in the University. South, South Dermot University in Odense, uh, and it's also part of the Danish Institute of Advanced Studies. And he'll tell us about geometric quantization of General Keller Manifold. Thank you.
Thank you. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here at this occasion where we will uh, discuss uh, 50 years of uh, Michael's mathematics. And, uh, and so I will simply, uh, well, first of all, thank the organizers because I'm officially no longer an organizer. Uh, of this <laughs> so for giving me the chance to give this talk. Uh, and then I want to go straight in, in one specific place where Nigel has contributed a lot. And that's uh, in, in the realm of quantum theory. Okay, and so I just want to try to start by giving a little general reminder about what is it actually quantum theory does. So in quantum mechanics, excuse me, uh, laser really works So quantum mechanics, what you do, of course, is you replace a phase space by a Hilbert space. We all know this, right? So unit vectors in this Hilbert space are states for the quantum system. And what we were supposed to do is have a process that takes classical observables. And so maybe the classical space is for M for phase space. And you take smooth functions on that, and it's supposed to upgrade them to operate as acting on the circumstances. And you would like these uh, direct actions to be satisfied. This quantization process should be linear. It should take the one function to the identity, and then it should take the Poisson bracket on the classical functions to the common system. I'll show you, remind you what the Poisson bracket is. But the Poisson bracket is in a second. Typically, these will only be density defined operators. Okay, we can live with that, no the problem. They will be formally self adjoint. And the time evolution of the system is simply given by the Schrodinger type equation, namely, the time derivative of the states is obtained by letting the Hamiltonian to the quantum Hamiltonian. So you take the classical Hamiltonian and you quantize it to put a head on it there, and then it acts in its limits. On the states this way. And if you want the time evolution of the points of observables, you have the corresponding equation here with the commutator H. Is that the FC? Excuse me? What? Nothing important. Is that the FC? I don't know what you're saying. P of C? In the problem, you have a P of the familiar sign. Uh, so, so far, I think it's okay. Now, let me have a look if there's something uh, funny. Yeah, I think that's a five. It's should be inside. Right. That's 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 we made a mistake there. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's right. So, now the question is what can you actually observe in such a system? Well, the only thing you can observe in these systems are these real eigenvalues of these formal self operators. Okay? And so they are defined to be the ones for which you have an eigenvector like this. And what happens, I mean, when you see this, so it's a stochastic process that tells you what the outcome is, you can only tell what the probabilities are. And the probabilities, if you have a system that's in a specific state psi, is simply the norm square of the inner product between psi and a given eigenstate. Okay, and then after the system has been measured out, it will actually project it to that state. So this is a typical quantum setup. Okay, well, I've actually gone all the way to two measurement, which we may as well ignore. Yes, and this set of question in instantaneous collapse. Instantaneous. Yeah, so I mean, I think that this is, I will not discuss this at all, but I mean, in this measurement, I really don't think anybody really understand what's going on with this measurement. Why is this measurement action like this? So I don't want to start a long discussion about this right now, but I'd be very happy to entertain this with everybody. I think it's a huge problem in theory, we don't understand it. Anyway, so let, let's think about how we would normally do it. So if you take Rn as the configuration space uh, and take R2 as the base space of the cotangent bundle on Rn, which is of course trivial, then what physicists say is that you take the Hilbert space, which is L2 of Rn, so say L2 of the configuration coordinates, and then you quantize according to the following rule Qi goes to multiplication operator, Qi goes to differentiation operator, and then they satisfy the canonical composition. And so, in particular, if you have Hamiltonians, which are the type that they are polynomials in the P's, and then maybe even analytic functions in the Q's, you can make an ordering choice and put all the P's to the right and make this kind of quantization process. And indeed, if you do this to the standard Hamiltonian, which is kinetic energy plus potential energy, you get exactly the usual training equation. Right? Okay. So that's totally standard from quantum mechanics. Uh, another thing that's also totally standard is that if you now identify R2n with Cn, okay, 
So instead of looking at functions of half coordinates, what you're going to do is you're going to look at holomorphic functions in this complex structure, the standard complex structure on R2M. And so in that case, what you're looking at is holomorphic functions, which are L2 with respect to this weighted L2 on the G right there. And if you now look at the you know, typical creation operators and annihilation operators, so A hat and A hat factor, they satisfy also the canonical computation relations. And indeed, the two things are totally equivalent. There is the Bachman transform that takes you from the previous Hilbert space to this Hilbert space. And it's given explicit to you by, by this formula right here. So just even with respect to some integration by some kernel work, this kernel is explicitly given here. And the nice thing about it is that that isomorphism of Hilbert spaces actually intertwines the operators. Okay, so it takes the quantization of the piece to the quantization of the piece and also the same for the cues because this is not combination of A hats and A hat baggage is the piece in the cues on the homomorphism. So perfect setup, right? And for example, if you go to the lab and talk to people who actually do this in the lab, they will agree completely with you. They use these two models constantly and everything fits with what they see here. This is a quantum optics lab. There is a laser, a laser pump over here. That laser pump goes into two crystals that squeezes the quadratures. So it takes a coherent state and makes this, a squeezes those quadratures in a coherent state. And then they exit those squeezes and they go into beam splitters. And from the beam splitters, they carry on to go into the uh, photon councils, which is up at the top. Everything here works exactly according to this nice canonical quantization scheme. So great. So let, let, whatever we come up with as that, an abstraction, this it definitely has to reproduce this, as we're not doing the physics that people care about in the physics. Okay, actually, this is a quantum computer. Sorry, quantum computer. All right. Now let's look at the general case. So let's start with a symplectic manifold. And we're going to do the standard pre-quantization of it. Well, the very simple conditions, right? First of all, we know that uh, the symplectic in this quantum computer is not what well, this is a little bit different from what most schemes of quantum computer with quantum data. Yeah, that's right. This is photonic quantum computer. It's not what you would it's not uh, it's not trapped ions, it's not the reaper mm -hmm. atoms, or it's not uh, superconducting qubits. Yeah. It is photonic qubits. So it's actually photonic few modes. And not Q bits. Gotcha. Because each mode is L2 of the real line as opposed to C2. Where C2 of Q bits, C L2 of the real line is a Q mode. So that's right. It's not the typical one, it's a photonic one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So study so is not the one that IBM works with, it's not the one that Microsoft works with, it's not the one Google works with. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. But uh, that's another talk. Uh, anyway, the quantization conditions. So, of course, we all know, you know the quantization condition you have to make is that omega should be an integral class, well, depending on the scaling of h bar. If that's the case, there exists a complex line bundle on M, emission structure on the line bundle, emission connection on the line bundle, in such a way that the current should detect the minus i divided by h bar. Boom. And then, of course, you can do pre quantum Hilbert space. You just take all the L2 sections of that line bundle. No problem. Uh, and then you can look at these uh, pre quantum operators, which you see right here. It's the function. And then you just take plus i h bar, and then you stick in a Hamiltonian vector field into the connection. Those guys are fantastic in a sense because they set it exactly on the nose, Dirac's quantization. <laughs> However, if you present this to the physicist, it's really bad news because it doesn't reproduce canonical quantization. So it will give you lots of contradictions with the physics we know. In particular, it will give you contradictions to Heisenberg on certain things. So this is not the right thing to do, as I think most of you know. But so what we have to do in general is really to pick what's called a polarization in geometric quantization. But I'm going to stick with only Keeler polarizations in this case. And so what are they? Well, they are simply just given by almost complex structures I, which are compatible with omega. So it means that. You know, if you stick in i and each other omega, you get back omega, i squares to minus the identity, and then I assume that i is integral. There is a sort of parallel discussion in the case of non-integrable i, but many things are somewhat different, so I won't 
uh, that we're assuming it's stability. And so, of course, if you combine omega and i, you get a Riemannian metric. So it's a Riemannian manifold that's also a symplectic manifold and a complex manifold, all in harmony. So it's a Kähler manifold. And on such a Kähler manifold, if I have this line bundle from before, this pre quantum line bundle, I can simply look at the polymorphic section of this line bundle with respect to this uh, complex one. Okay. And so if I have uh, you know, or rather, I just take the volume form, which is omega to the n divided by n factorial, and then I can actually introduce the Hilbert space structure on the space if I want to, right? And notice that Hilbert space structure is something the physicist wants because, you know, uh, it really is important to determine the spectrum. And that is really important on the bottom of what is the actual Hilbert space structure because you might find some. You know, the vectors that are not in L2 and then they're not physical. So we have to really worry about the L2 system if we want to, you know, really somehow correspond to this as well. Anyway, I think that this is maybe not the right, it's very canonical and classical, and, but I don't think it's the right in, in, in all cases, you know, but I'll, I'll show you a little more about it. But anyway, we can, of course, consider it. Okay, so the sort of big open problems in this field. That has been a, a, around actually before uh, I was a student of Nigel, or maybe even before Nigel was a student of Nigel. <laughs> uh, is that, you know, how does this thing depend on I? How does the Hilbert space depend on I? Uh, what is the right free quantum Hilbert space structure we should consider? So, in other words, what is the inner product that we should consider? Uh, and how do we quantize observables? Because observables have to act on the space, right? So it can see the with the section. And so, uh, you know, I, I, you must correct me, Marshall, if, if that's not true. But I think that the sort of mantra was back in those days that it, the quantization could be independent of the polarization. Yeah. So, uh, so that's a good question. And I wonder whether that's true. <laughs> But anyway, I mean, it's uh, it's certainly uh, you know, is it really independent of I, or does it depend on I in a particular way, or what's going on? Another good uh, question is, well, uh, what the Hilbert space structure? Of course, I can choose the one that I showed you before this one, but is it the right one? Well, certainly for the science theory, this is not the one. So we have many examples where this is not the right one. Okay, uh, and uh, finally, uh, we have no answer to the Greek in general. Okay, so we don't know how to do this, right? There's no geometric formula that we can just pull out from the textbooks of geometric conversation and do it. But so what I want to do in this talk here is that I will provide a new take on one, two, three, four. Okay, and I will somehow argue against that it's not really independent of polarization, but I will give you a construction of quantizational observables, and I will also give you a construction of inner products, and I will also give you a partial answer to one in such a way that all three plays together because it's very important to play together. If you have some way of identifying the different H's for different I, then your construction should be natural with respect to this. Okay, but so a little uh, warning now. I'm going to change the notation. So one over H bar I'm going to call K. And then uh, what I call LH so far, so it's going to be the K tensor power of some specific L. And so I'm going to switch my notation to for the Hilbert space to be H over Ki. And I'm also going to switch from uh, Psi being uh, the state vector to S being the state vector. So please don't get confused about this little bit of change in pitch. Okay, so let's try to get started. And so what I want to do is really start where I learned uh, uh, where Nigel started, okay? So, so what, what, what he was emphasizing was that, well, let's try to consider family of complex structures. And let's try to see if we can understand what happens in families. So, you know, in the flat space case, there are perfect implications like what I showed you, these uh, Bachmann transformations and so on. But it's really that need to expect that this will go over again. And so what, what can be the case is something completely different, namely a connection. I'll talk about that now. So let's have a family of complex structures. So I just assume that I have some map from some parameter space T to the space of almost complex structures in such a way that each point sigma 
In the front of the space, I have a kilo matrix. And what I'm also going to assume is that the subspace of holomorphic sections of the smooth section to L to the K forms a nice subbond, okay, of this infinite dimensional trivial bond. So particular ranks are all constant in this family here. Of course, they could jump, right? And I'm going to eliminate that. So I'm going to assume that they're all constant. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that this is a smooth subbond of this trivial subbond. Well, this sorry, this trivial bundle over this primary space. And now, of course, the basic idea is to look for connections in this bundle. And then I will use parallel transport along this primary space to identify the fibers for different complex structures. Okay. So a few simple observations. Well, if you happen to have a initial structure on this bundle already, so you fix which inner product you want to have, this could very well depend on I, right? Well, it will depend on I because the space is dependent on I. So uh, if you fix that, well, then of course, parallel transport will be unitary if and only the connection is initial. And of course, we were hoping for unitary equivalences because if we change the Hilbert space structure, then we change the physics. We'd like to see that the physics is not changed, so therefore we want a unitary parallel transport. Also, of course, if this connection you know, the parallel transport is projectively or independent of the homotopy class of a path between the two complex structures, if and only if the connection is either projectively flat or flat. And I remind you that projectively flat just means that there is a two form of the base. So when you tell that with the identity, you get a curvature. And of course, if there is a symmetry group, I would like to also quantize the symmetry group. So suppose I have some group gamma that acts by automorphism of the line bundle, each one's a line bundle. Reducing to spectromorphism from the base. And moreover, let's assume that I also have the gamma x on this parameter space, T, in such a way that my family is gamma x. Well, if that's the case, we can remark that projective flatness under 2 implies that we have a projective action of a pi 1 of T extension of gamma. And also, of course, if you preserve the initial structure, this will be a unit server or projective unit. Okay, so that's kind of just formal setups in the story. Okay, now can we actually expect always to have a projective flat connection in the setting? Well, there is of course topological obstructions to actually having this. So one of them is obtained by just considering the Grodenberg Riemann Rock formula. So let's have a you know a family of complex manifold parameterized by some T. It's a holomorphic manifold projecting down to T holomorphically. And I'm assuming that I have a line bundle all over N. And I'm assuming that if you take this line bundle restricted to each of the fibers of this projection, so it's a vibration, uh, then uh, all the high commodity would change. Because in that case, it's very nice. And I would have an induced bundle just at the X series. Okay. So now the question is, how do I actually compute the churn character of this H0 along the fibers? Well, in this case here, the world of the Rock theorem simply says that the churn character of HK is the push forward of the churn character of LK in the total space, coupled with the top class of the vertical tangent bundle, and then push forward. Okay? So therefore, what I can do now is I can simply just, okay, let's look at that. What does that amount to? Okay, so I can just say, okay, let me take C to be the third term that's of the line bundle. Then I decompose the top class into its degree pieces like this. And then the Groden Freeman Rock theorem simply reads that the term character is given by this explicit expression here, summing P equals zero up to R, these are the degrees. And then you have this particular expression for all the degree of the train character in each of the degrees that it has. This is just the parameter of what I said on the previous page, it's just spread out in degrees. But now, what does it mean to actually have a projectively flat connection? Well, by train theory, it's a unitary connection. What I know is that, well, then there will exist a specific two form on the base, two class on the base, in such a way that the churn character of the bundle. It's just the rank of the bundle times the exponentiation of that class. 
right? That's a probably a little bit injected in flat. And so if you just work out what does this actually mean, you will get the equations that you see for each C at the bottom. Okay. And so these are obstructions to exist in the projection of flat connection in these bonds. And so do we have any examples where we know that this is not satisfying? Well, we do actually, because suppose you just take the universal curve over the moduli states. We're just looking at PNG curves fibering over MG, where G is bigger than two. Then I consider the leafwise cotangent bond. Okay. So the leafwise cotangent bond has exactly this property. If G is bigger than two, that you know, well, I think it's also true for G is the two bit, but it, it but but uh, it has this property that H1 along the fibers is zero. And so now I can simply just compute my uh, trend character of the push forward of these guys here. This is the pre constant line or some power of to this case here. Too. So I just compute this uh, formula here and I get the following expression in K and the Kappa classes on the modular space. And so the previous relations would be saying to you, there are tons of relations among the Kappa classes, right? They're all related. But we know that the first many Kappa classes, it depends on the genes, how many, right? Are completely linear independent. So that cannot be the case in this example here. So there's a clear obstruction to have for this bundle to have a projective effect connection. It does not. Okay. All right. You know, you would say that the old kappa, kappa D is a function of kappa one for all of them, you know that. Yeah, very Okay. Talk to some number that depends here. All right. So now let's look at this sort of general setup here. What can we actually do? So let's try nevertheless to try to build some connections. We may not get projectively flat, but let's see what can we do get instead. Of. So let's try to analyze the situation. I have a family of kilo polarizations like this, kilo structures. And what I can do is I can take a vector field on T and I can differentiate along T. Okay, so if I differentiate along T, I will of course get a new endomorphism of the tangent bundle. And this endomorphism will anti-commute with I. Simply just following from the fact that if you differentiate I squared to the minus identity, you will see that it anti-commutes. Okay, well that means that the derivative actually splits into two pieces, namely the first piece you see up here and the second piece you see up here, and they are giving you the sum gives you the derivative, the full derivative. So there are two different guys, right? The types, two different types. It's off the angle with respect to the decomposition with respect to I. Okay. And so now there's a further condition we can make. Namely, suppose that T is a complex manifold. Then we say that the family is a complex family or holomorphic family, if and only if, well, on down on T, I can take a vector field and I can split it into prime and double prime, the usual way for more the more morphic direction. And so I wanted it exactly in such a way that if I take those two and differentiate I, that's the same getting the two pieces that are split into. This is just a fancy or explicit way of saying that actually there is an induced complex structure on T cross M in such a way that the projection is homomorphic. And there is such a the whole thing that the complex manifold M cross T and the projection is homomorphic. Okay, so I'm going to assume this is the example that you had before about the universal curve. Does it satisfy? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, now uh, let's have a look here. Sorry, but I go for yeah. So now let's look here. So I'm going to look at the trivial C infinity of M L to the K bundle. And I'm going to look at the trivial connection in this trivial bundle. And then what I'm seeking is a connection that will preserve the sub of the polymorphic guys. And the form that will take, well, if it's a connection on the whole thing, is it will definitely be the trivial connection plus some u, where u is of one form on t, the values in endomorphism of the bundle, right? That's the general thing about connections. They're affine on this space. So I'm going to search for such guys like this, or rather, I just search for such guys like this. I just follow the master, right? So, uh, and not only that, I will want to have it in such a way that this one form takes values in differential operators. Because 
that's easier to work with in some sense. I mean, generally, the morphisms of such a human space can be rather nasty, but the half of the differential geometry with them, at least. Right? But if they're, if they're given by differential geometry, we can do differential geometry. Okay, so let's look at what, what is actually at play here. So, what is the condition for such a connection to preserve the subbundle of homomorphisms? Well, it turns out that a U uh, gives you a connection via this formula here, trivial connection plus U, that preserves the subbundle of homomorphic things, if and only if you satisfy this, this condition, this single equation for U. So it says if you take a section of, uh, so, so just take the uh, homomorphic sections parameterized by, by the T variable, right? You apply U to it and you apply the the D bar operator and the line bundle to that, then that is the thing on the left. The derivative of I contracted with the one zero derivative of S. So that's a connection. This is a, sorry, this is the equation that you have to solve in order to find connections that gives you the right kind of connections on the front so that they can serve for a more Great. Okay. So let's now look at the various types. Okay. So the thing is that this uh, one zero derivative, of course, is of the wrong type to be contracted with a guy with a double prime on it. Okay, because remember the guy with the double prime on it is something that lies in T bar and so these other thing. So if I want to take that vector field and stick into something that is of type one zero, you get zero. So that is telling me that actually in the anti-holomorphic direction. There is a very canonical solution, namely just u of that equal to zero. In other words, the trivial connection zero one part just induces a holomorphic structure like in this vector. So it's a holomorphic problem. Okay, so that's all. Boom, immediately, no problem. Of course, that direction that I've set it up the way I have is not a problem. It's the holomorphic direction that I interested. In. Okay, but we can use this comment for something, namely. In other words, this bundle is a holomorphic bundle. So if you fix a Hermitian structure on it, and actually it turns out that if M is compact, any Hermitian structure in the bundle is of the form I write up here. So it's just the same as L2, except I have put in a weight function here, some e to some function. This is by Turpik's operator theory that you can see that any other product is of this form. When you take tensor powers of the line bundle, do you need that freedom of being able to change the Hermitian metric at each stage? Or yeah, you could, right? I mean, there's different bundles that could have both different problems. You might want to correlate them in some way, you know, so that you think of a limit as k goes infinity and some limit as h bar goes to two. But in principle, you have freedom to choose it for every case. And this thing here gives you a specific behavior at infinity. So when I say all Hermitian structures are really small, it's a k by k statement. So if you take arbitrary family to emission structures with parameters like by K, I cannot necessarily write them in this form. Okay. But let's consider things of this form, or you can in fact consider any emission structure you want, because I just remind you the very simple thing that is always a character, right? If you have a holomorphic bundle with a emission structure on it, of course I can consider the trend function. That's the connection to zero one part is the deep bar operator in the, in the vector bundle, and then it should preserve the Hermitian structure. But now comes questions like, okay, that's fine, but what is the curvature of this thing? And can we choose HK in such a way that it's projectively flat? Well, we know the instructions for doing this, so we cannot even jump. But what are the conditions for being able to do this? And uh, can we always write this guy in the form of the trivial connection for some one form? So it's not so easy to answer these questions directly. At the end of the talk, if I get to it, I will answer this question. Okay. But let's not uh, actually really worry about that right now. I just wanted to make you think about this for a second. There is some coupling between the connection and the emission structure on the other, right? But uh, I just want to actually show you this uh, condition here. Actually, I want to skip this for now. What I want to show you is the original construction by Nigel that solves this problem in a very specific situation. The situation is the following. There is a way to create a symmetric two sensor 
g of v based on the derivative of the complex structure. You name it, say v prime of i, and then you say I want g to be the unique symmetric two tensor with the property that when I contract it with omega, I get that derivative of i. Okay, since omega is invertible, that gives you a unique g of v. And there is a very special condition on families, uh, which I called rigid, uh, and maybe that gives some confusion because it doesn't mean that the complex structure is rigid, but it means that the family is rather rigid. It's a huge condition on the family, namely to ask that this G of V is holomorphic. There are not so many families that satisfy this condition, but it turns out that the family of complex structures, so killer structures on the modular space of flat connections, Satisfies this property when you take the ones that come from time. <coughs> okay. So, in fact, so that's what Nigel said. He said that, okay, let's take, assume M is compact. Let us assume that the G's that we get this way are holomorphic. Let us further assume a kind of phenotype condition, namely there exists a lambda in the rationals. So, the lambda times omega is the first term class of M omega. And finally, let's assume that A01 is zero. So under those three conditions, Nigel was able to construct an explicit view which preserves homomorphism. And he was able to apply this to the modular space of flat issue and connections on the surface and to prove that in fact, in this case here, you get a projectively flat connection which lives over the modular space of curves. So it's in the bundle HK living over the modular space of curves. A very beautiful explicit construction and let me show you what the connection is here is the view explicitly given in terms of growth and differential operators so let me try to unpack it for you g of v is this two tensor that i just told you about that two tensor you can use to create a kind of uh, a class operator you differentiate the sections you contract the g you differentiate the n now also using the kilo metric and then finally you take the trace that's the second order part. And then the first order part is simply just where you take D of F and what is F? F is the Ricci potential. So notice that I have this condition B that says that the class of omega is proportional to first term class of M. First term class of M is given by the Ricci curvature, right? The form that's representing that class. So therefore, we know that there exists an F of this form because any exact one one form on a kilo manifold is the effect of this type. Um, so that's the Ricci potential, the function on the manifold, and I can take the D of that and contract with the G of E to give you a vector field that can be stuck into the connection. And finally, I can do if this depends on sigma in the parameter space, so I can take and differentiate this F and get the fun a new function, and that's the function I put into the connection. So this is the second order of differential operator giving you a total position on the community. Beautiful. Right. Okay. Well, there's a little remark here that I come back to in the next slide. I think I want to skip this. But I just want to show you how is the, how does the, how does the proof of this go? Okay, to so give you a little bit of details on the proof. So you want to solve this equation up there, as I told you before. Else it could not preserve for motricity, right? I have to solve the equation up there. I'm under the assumption that G is holomorphic. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to guess that it starts with the second order term. And then for some reason, I'm also going to subtract this first order term. So I'm going to skip one argument of the Nigel speed. But I just look at this specific difference. And now I take the D bar operator of that. And what I now have to do is, of course, come, you know, commute the D bar operator all the way over until it hits the holomorphic section and then it goes away. And what I'm left with is a common term. And the reason why I don't get something of second order is because the symbol G is holomorphic in this case. So when that hits the symbol, I get zero. The G of E holomorphic is super important to me. So I would not get a second order, sorry, a first order operator as a common term. I would get a second order. But anyway, okay, that's nice. That's the case here. And then it turns out that, you know, when I pass these commentators out, I get from the first term exactly the kind of thing I want. Because remember, G, GV omega is exactly the derivative of R. So up to a scale, right, it's the right thing. And then I'm left with something that's left over, which is a mistake. Okay. 
So the third, these two, the first guess here didn't quite solve the problem. Or it did almost up to a multiplicity factor, but there is a correction term. But now I look at the second term. It's a zero one form on M multiplied onto S. So that's it. It's just a zero one form. And then the computation shows that it's D bar close. You just do explicit computation on this side and check the D bar that it's zero. So of course, if it's a D bar closed form of type zero one, and if we assume that H zero one is zero, well, then I can write it as D bar of some function. And so that function, f of b, is my function that can go into the connection of the double problem. And so it turns out, in fact, actually, that function is exactly b prime applied to the Ricci potential. So this is the proof. But notice it goes this way. It starts with the leading order term, or guess what the leading order term should be, and then I work back downwards in degrees of operators. Okay. It's going to be important in a second. Okay. All right, just a few remarks here. It turns out that if you look at a couple of hitching connections and look at their corresponding use, so the condition for being a hitching connection is exactly to preserve polymorphicity. And it turns out, in fact, that if you preserve polymorphicity locally, so now I have to come back to the slide that I skipped. This one here, what does it mean to preserve polymorphicity locally? Well, it's sort of obvious, right? So U is a differential operator. So U can be restricted to open neighborhoods on M. And so preserving homomorphicity locally just means that it satisfies this equation, even for sections of S that are only defined locally, but homomorphic. So that's what it means to preserve homomorphicity locally. That's a little stronger than actually preserving a global homomorphic section. If, M, if K is very large and M is compact, those two conditions are totally equivalent. But technically, they're not quite equivalent for all of them. Okay, so that because there are lots of polymorphic sections locally, but there may not be so many locally. But if you have a connection of this form that preserves homomorphicity locally, it turns out that the, so, so given by U, and I have two of them, U1 and U2, it turns out that if they both preserve homomorphicity locally, then they will actually have the same symbol. They're forced to do that. So that gives you a big constraint of what kind of second order operator you can actually have if you want this condition to be satisfied. And the argument is simply just because when you look at the equation they have to satisfy, you very quickly show this relation to in the middle of the slide. And V of I is, of course, uniquely determined by the family. So a corollary of this is that the space of second order operators which preserves homomorphicity locally, they form an affine space model on one form some T with values in H0 of the tangent bundle plus H0 of O. So in particular, if M is compact or if you, for some other reason, don't have any holomorphic functions and you don't have any consistent holomorphic automorphism to the kernel manifold, well, then it's unique. <laughs> okay. All right. So that gives you a little bit of sort of, uh, you can't vary too much. And here's an elementary generalization of a nitro death that's just combined the few things that I just said. So if you have, again, G is holomorphic, you have the phenotype condition, you have H01 and 0. And if you now assume that F is something that there exists, the Ricci potential. So you don't use such theory to actually define this Ricci potential, you just assume that it's there. Then the observation is you don't have to be M as compact. Okay. And actually, if you now further have that, you know, if you look at things that are locally preserving polymorphicity, well, this view that you find this way will do that. And if you then kill the two sort of groups that tells you what parameter space there is, then it's unique. And in fact, also it's projectively flat in all of these cases. So that's, a, that's a nice little thing. It actually comes out to be projectively flat when you have all these conditions. But no need for it to be compact. And so that's a nice thing because then you can apply some smooth part of the moduli spaces in various cases. And so the, the next thing is to sort of try to pinpoint A and C and D and try to remove them, right? Step by step. But I won't really dwell much into this. This is a huge uh, sort of program. Uh, Metaplectic correction actually removes B, and then we can apply this to the moduli spaces. We can obtain results that are similar to what Richard Wentworth 
uh, and company are obtaining uh, on a marginalized basis of parabolic bundles. And so I will skip that entirely and go beyond that. But so I want to focus on condition A because that is the hardest to remove. So A is the fact that G is promoting. This is a very strong condition. And by the way, it better not apply you know, to the universal curve, right? That's the internal contribution of what I've told you so far. But indeed, if you look at it, there is no G that's holomorphic on the universal curve. There are no holomorphic sections in the settings where the technical on these curves, right? So you can't even start moving the complex structure on the ring without getting into trouble with this condition. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to somehow start back again and look at this family. So I'm going back to I, which is a map from this parameter space into almost complex structures. And so now I'm going to consider a specific linear map, which goes from L symmetric tensors to L minus one tensor the uh, dual of the anti for a and it is simply just the thing that you just take that uh, only can contract with the G if it's uh, G1. You just I K times only can contract with the G. This will have an effect like this, like right? goes from the polymorphic tendon bundle to uh, the uh, anti polymorphic coating bundle. And in general, what I want to do is that I want to you to take I K omega plus and then take the curvature tensor. And then use that to contract on GL. And I'll show you precisely this contraction I mean in a second. Okay, so there's a well defined contraction in GL when L is bigger than two that gives you a map like this. So I consider this purely linear and algebraic map. Okay. And now another thing that I want to do is I want to define higher order differential operators acting in sections of L to the K. Maybe if you have such a symmetric L tensor, I want to define what it means to differentiate respect to that L tensor. And so I do this inductively by simply saying, how do you define the derivative of respect to an L tensor? Well, here's the inductive formula. It's constructed in such a way that it is functional linear over all variables. And it's sort of the only way I think you can do if you want that condition to hold. So this canonical construction or extending to higher tensors of a differential respect to those. Okay, so I'm going to use those two now. So this had a little map and inside a relative like this. And so um, first uh, uh, proposition is the following. If you assume that the Ricci curve is parallel, so I know this cuts way down on the spaces I'm considering, but I will eliminate this. In a second, but if it is parallel, there is a very simple formula for how to commute the D bar operator past this kind of operator. Okay, it namely says that so if you act on the holomorphic section with this differential operator and say the D bar operator, what you get is the D bar operator applied to the symmetric tensor minus, and then this linear map applied to G. So this linear map applied to G is exactly made of this model. And notice that is of order one less. Okay. Great. So, uh, in fact, the general case is a little bit more complicated. Okay. So here's the general case. So if you don't assume the G is that R is parallel, so it's not a symmetric space. Okay. Then what happens is that there are lots of tensors. There are these A and J tensors, which goes from the space on the left you see there to the space on the right. And then the condition is that there exist these guys and they are unique actually, such that if you take this parameter derivative uh, degree L guy with respect to GL and you apply the zero, the D bar operator to it, what you will get is what you see above, what you expect first, is first you get the D bar operator applied to GL, then you get the term where you're just contracting with omega that comes from the curvature of the line bundle. And then there's a whole mess of things that comes out of the curvature of the remaining metric. So I can actually show you explicitly what these guys are. So first at the top, you see recursive relations for how these guys look like. 
And you notice that you know the first side, the first the one that has up something and down one, is a function only of the curvature. But the next following ones will involve derivatives of the curvature. And so when I take the, you know, when I look at the condition of the derivative of the curve being to zero, I eliminate most of the tower at but if the full tower is right here, and there are completely explicit formulas for A, 1N, this is a specific combination of applying the, 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 the Riemann curvature to these Gs. And so on down, and you see the next one involves one derivative of R, and all the way up to N minus two derivatives of R. So here it's written with N, but if you think of the L derivative, the L, the GL, the degree L tensor will involve L minus two derivatives of the curvature. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this to quantize functions. So I'm going to start by saying I would like to take a function and I would like to produce an operator that preserves for homophysity. And so what I'm going to do is you know simply just solve these equations that I now have and iteratively we built them up. But the funny thing is, I will not start at the top of the group. I will start at degree zero and build it the other way around. So remember, Nigel started at degree two and went down for his connection. I'm going to start at degree zero and build upwards. And so if I start with a function, that will be the zero order guy. So that's the zero order symmetric tensor. Now, the next guy that I'm going to build actually will just be the Hamiltonian vector field of that F. That's going to be the degree one G. And then there is a whole system of equations that I have to satisfy. But notice that I can solve these equations if K is large enough. Because when I'm doing it this way, I am not solving hard D bar problems. Because I'm just starting with a function. Then I apply the D bar operator to it. Then I do something algebraic to turn it into a vector field. Then I apply the D bar again do something algebraic to turn it into a two tensor and so on. So because K is large, I can always do this. So I'm not solving any, any differential equation with like deep operators, but I'm going the other way and then it's much easier to start algebraic. Okay. So it turns out that there is a unique, if K is large enough, there's a unique set of solutions to these equations. Uniform, to all orders. But they keep going. I mean, if I don't, if I'm not in a very lucky situation, they will keep going. But this is the, the, the regularity class of the solutions is. Well, large. they are smooth, all of them. Mm -hmm. But now we will discuss what about the sum? Mm -hmm. okay. So, you know, what you would like to actually have is that this is a well defined operator. Okay. okay. But so, at least if I now for a moment assume that this sum is convergent. Okay. Then I can just formally check that it actually preserves for homophysity because if I assume that it's convergent and there's such a rate that I'm allowed to put the deep operator inside the sum, well, then inside the sum it does exactly what I've set it up to do, and it's only taking zero. So this guy who actually preserves for homophysity formally. Okay. And so it turns out, or oh, actually, we can make now a definition say that quantizable functions is the subspace of smooth functions for which the sum is convergent such that it acts as well defined operators on the formal set. And now the question is how large is that? Sorry. And then I can say something about it. But yeah, I just want to, first of all, I can tell you that all the analytic functions on M are actually in the but this is not so easy as you might think, because the sum will actually still be divergent, and you have to do something interesting to it, even in that case. In some cases, okay, for flat space is actually convergent. If you apply it, then, well, there are several things I could say about that, but let, let me not get bogged down with that right now. Anyway, the analytic functions are in there, the local. And the functions are just making Taylor series has to be converted to parts of radius to be equal to the function local. Now, and then we get the following nice conditions that are analog of Dirac's actions. If you take the products of these two, the first order and one over k, they're just the path of the product. 
And second of all, if you take the commutator and multiply by k, because that will cancel the third order by the above thing, then that is the pair on the bottom bracket with a mistake of one over k. And that's exactly what you expect. Yeah, so I started my watch when you gave me the word, and I've spent 15 minutes so far. But uh, you still want to stop. So just wanted to say that. But I, I maybe give me five minutes and I'll stop. Okay. So what I'm saying is that. Uh, yeah. So this series turns out to be factorially divergent, even for an analytic function. Well, at least it is at most uh, factorially divergent. For an analytic company, it might be some analytic company, for example, for normals, it's not a flash, it's certainly <laughs> it stops after a while. But, uh, but in general, what I can prove is that this is the most factorially divergent. Okay. And so, uh, what I will see now is a fast review of researchers because I don't have any time, but that kind of an interesting pro problem, uh, you know, that's the one we are developing under the new quantum. So there is a way to deal with divergent series, you know, and this is, of course, what's called the Borel the flash resummation thing. So if you're familiar with that, we just go on with that. If not, I would have to tell you what this is. But I don't have time, so I will skip entirely over how to do this. But it's a very, very beautiful thing, which is not simple to apply. It uh, requires trickery in each case to apply, but it's very nice. So it has to do with all kinds of beautiful things about analytic functions and, uh, you know, the Cal's formulation of alien calculus, but also now reformulated by conservative conservative in terms of actually the wall crossing thing that we now, you guys know a lot about in the Earth century, the same thing, but applied in the program here. Uh, I won't say so much about it, but it turns out that there is a multivalued function in the holomorphic plane with values and operators, that is well defined. So it's not single value. And this is exactly what you expect for quantization, is that you will not get something single value. You know, typically if you have pass intervals, you will not get the answer single value in the plane. It has all kinds of jumping phenomena and very interesting stuff. Uh, you know, it's related to these bundles and so on in a way that I don't want to discuss right now, but it's very interesting. Anyway. So from now on, I will skip the fact, but, I, but the idea is that you just take the series I had before, you just put in the factorial, and now it's convergent, and then you apply a little class transform to come back. But that requires some words before you can do this well. But it turns out it can be done. Well. Okay, uh, actually it turns out that it can, it has a reformulation in terms of turbulence operators you see here. So if you consider the usual orthogonal projection onto homomorphic things and you assume that M is compact and you use the inner product that I don't like, uh, uh, you know, always, then it turns out that, of course, because it can preserve homomorphicity, you can just compose it with a projection and you won't change it. But now, if the sum is convergent, and so I, I conclude the necessary convergence to move the projection inside, and then the point is that when you compose these, this differential operator with a projection, it turns out that it's actually the turbulence operator of some other function. And so what you find is that you can actually write a pad as some infinite sum of turbulence operators. And it turns out the first one is, of course, F. The second one is the flash operator, of to F, and so on. So there is a way to do this in terms of turbulence operators. Okay, but now what about connections? Because I said that it should not just be about contact the functions, so it should be connections, right? And so it turns out that what you're going to do with connection is that you will do exactly like you did with function, except for one big change. Before I was asked constantly that, the, that this equation was solved where there's no V prime of I. And so now I'm asked of one form some T with values and functions, and I'm just going to do it exactly in the way that, uh, you know, I just adjust but the second degree part with the derivative of i. Because if I do that adjustment, it turns out that I get some infinite order operator. It depends on k, of course. And the, the theorem is that this guy here satisfies the equation. So it gives me a whole slew of Hitchin connections, which are exactly similar to the Hitchin connection, except that now in its infinite order, it is built from the bottom up. And it starts with a one form on T with various and smooth functions. So if you take V prime applied to the Ricci potential and stick in for A, 
and you assume that G is holomorphic, you will exactly get Hitchens connection. So the whole system truncates the second order and gives his connection. But now I have this freedom. I can start with any A I want and run this. And if A is analytic, so take that as an analytic function instead of smooth function, the whole thing will work the same way. It's probably summable, and I can do this game. So, you know, what I, that's what I'm saying here, that there is some subspace for which this actually works. And it gives you that this space here for which it works that now parameterizes these Hitchin functions. So there are tons of Hitchin functions actually, but they're given by infinite order operators and not by second order operators always. Okay. Uh, what you can show is that, well, if you apply this construction even to a K-dependent one form to begin with, what you can show is that uh, if it is if, it's, if it's the covariant derivative applied to it is zero of modular one over k, then the corresponding connection will be asymptotically flat. If it turns, if you have it in such a way that when you take the derivative, it's just a two form on t, then it will be asymptotically projectively flat. We have analogs of this this gain in this situation here. Uh, let me just carry on with this. So here's what I said before, namely, if you in the rich case apply it to the one form, which is simply just V prime applied to F, then you can get exactly Nyquist's construction out of this machine. Okay, and it truncates, right? Because we make this assumption here from the beginning, and so it truncates to the second order level. Else it would not do, we just continue. So we can actually extend the connection construction if you have a situation where we have a rich potential, you can just take this A and it will continue going with infinite operators in them. But it will be a Hitchin connection. It will preserve for more. So uh, actually, here I come back to the Hermitian structures. So if you choose, so, so lots of things going on here. But if you start by saying, I know what the Hermitian structure is, it's a given for this form here. Then it turns out I know exactly which A you should choose so that you start with that A, you build this infinite tower of operators, and the corresponding Hitchin connection will be. The uh, trend So I know in this formula is how to build the trend connection from the inner part of this way. Okay. So uh, here's the sort of setup that I propose for, for, for quantization. First of all, we do the standard setup. Okay, we do a symplectic manifold, we do pre quantization now. But then I would say that what really needs to, to go in when you quantize is you have to decide which family of complex structures you want to work with. And your quantization will depend on the choice of that family. But once you make that family choice, well, then there is a way to construct these unitary, these unitary structures if you choose now such a function, a function on T with values and smooth functions that may have an asymptotic expansion one on OK, then you can introduce the unitary structure this way. You can then, as I said before, introduce connections that are compatible with this, and the quantization of functions are compatible with this construction. So they all three play together well, but all of it depends on T. And which functions you can actually quantize here, because now it becomes a one over K expansion that you have to understand and so on, in the cases for each family, it will depend on the family. So as I said before, you know, you have explicit formula for the trend connections. So it's going a little fast now, but I want to try to finish in time. But the point is that, yeah, I want to skip entirely this because I didn't give you enough details to explain this, but I just want to make a final remark, namely the quantization really depends on the choice of T. Uh, the bigger gamma is, the bigger T will have to be because you know, the bigger you make the symmetry group, the bigger it has to be. For example, if you want to quantize in such a way that the whole symplectomorphism acts as a symmetry group, then you have to make T the infinite dimensional space of all k structures. If you do that, then you know you force the quantizable uh, operators. I mean, the functions that you can quantize will be pushed down by this process. Okay, but if you, for example, say I will just look at a specific Keeler structure on my manifold and I just care about that, I'm not allowing any symmetries that goes outside this. Well, then you can quantize all the analytic functions on that. There is this dichotomy between how big a symmetry group do I want to preserve in the quantization and what kind of functions can I quantize. 
Because the opposite extreme is that if you choose gamma to be all of the complex then the only things you can quantize are constant functions in a consistent way. <laughs> okay. And they're far from being all projected to be flat or flat. They have their curvature. And that means that when you take a little loop in the space of complex structure, you will experience the holonome on the quantum system. Okay. Thanks for that.